Hello, everyone, and welcome to the American Physiological Society's webinar for the distinguished lectureship of the Henry Pickering Bowditch Award. I'm Patricia Terrell, the Meeting and Programs Coordinator for APS. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend the Henry Pickering Bowditch Award lecture titled Nutrient Cysting in the Placenta and Pancreas, Fetal Programming of Obesity and Type 2 Diabetes. Today's lecture is presented by Dr. Emlyn Alejandro and moderated by our current APS president, Dr. D. Silverthorne and former APS president, Dr. Linda Samuelson. Before we begin, here are a few important housekeeping notes. The lecture will be recorded and made available for on-demand viewing within 48 hours of the APS website. To maintain scientific integrity and respect for our presenters, please refrain from taking photos or videos of this presentation in whole or in part. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will find the Q&A and chat features. To ensure prompt receipt of your question, we ask that you use only the Q&A feature to submit your questions, and you may do so at any time during the lecture. In addition, captions are available by clicking the live transcript icon also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So without further delay, let's get the webinar started. And I'd like to have this opportunity to introduce Dr. D. Silverthorne, and she is the Emeritus President at the University of Texas at Austin and our current President of the American Physiological Society and co-moderator for, for the lecture. Dr. Silverthorne, I turn it over to you to extend your welcome and introduce our remaining distinguished panelists. Thank you, Patricia, and I will make a small correction, which is I am a professor emerita and not the president emerita for the University of Texas. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Welcome to the first virtual Henry Pickering Bowditch Award lecture. Uh, as Patricia said, I'm Dee Silverthorne, current president of the American Physiological Society. And today I'm co-hosting the presentation along with Linda Samuelson, past president of the APS. The Bowditch Award Lecture is one of the top honors bestowed by the APS. The award is named for one of the founders and the first president of the society, Henry Pickering Bowditch. Dr. Bowditch received his medical degree from Harvard and then studied physiology in Europe, first with Claude Bernard in France and then with Carl Ludwig in Germany. He returned to Harvard as a faculty member where he mentored another famous name in physiology, Walter B. Cannon. Dr. Bowditch went on to be chair of the Department of Physiology and later Dean of the Medical School at Harvard. And in 1887, he became one of the five founders of the APS. The Bowditch Award Lecture is named in his honor and started in 1956 and it is presented annually. It recognizes original and outstanding accomplishments in the field of physiology by someone who is no more than 42 years old or who is within eight years of starting their first position after postdoctoral training. To introduce this year's Bowditch awardee, Dr. Emmelyn Alejandro, I will now turn the microphone over to Linda Samuelson. Thanks, Dee. Um, it's really a delight for me to introduce the 2022 Henry Pickering Bowditch Award lecturer, Dr. Emmeline Alejandro. Emmeline um, is the McKnight Presidential Fellow, the Maurice Vischer Biomedical Scholar, and an Associate Professor of Integrative Biology and Physiology at the University of Minnesota. After obtaining her BS at the University of Washington, she traveled to northward to the University of British Columbia, where she got a, a PhD in physiology, working with James Johnson, and then came um, to the Midwest, to the University of Michigan, to do a postdoctoral fellowship with Ernesto Bernal Mizrachi. She joined the faculty at the University of Minnesota in 2015, 
and um, has um, established a very successful research program, um, quickly becoming NIH funded and publishing important work in the area of metabolic programming of pancreatic beta cell development. Um, she is um, defining mechanisms um, of how diabetes and insulin dysregulation um, predispose offspring to metabolic disease. And so today she's going to deliver the Bowditch Award Lecture, which is titled Nutrient Sensing in the Placenta and Pancreas, Fetal Programming of Obesity and Type 2 Diabetes. Congratulations, uh, um, Emmeline, and I look forward to your presentation. You're muted. Hi, can you see my slide? Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Samuelson, and what an honor it is for me to receive this award. And I am deeply humbled to be giving the Bowditch Lecture, given that previous awardees have been luminaries in the field. So I hope for the next 40 minutes, I'll get to illustrate some vignettes of some of the findings that we've uncovered here at the University of Minnesota uh, on the role of nutrient sensor proteins in the placenta, as well as in the pancreas. So greetings from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, this is, uh, I'm talking to you uh, in the building that you're looking at here. I took this picture this morning at the Cancer and Cardiovascular Research Building um, where our department IBP is housed. So I wanna begin with the world map of the incidence of diabetes around the world. As you can see here, um, there are 537 million of individuals uh, currently uh, experiencing this disease. And this is projected to increase in 20 years to reach about 784 million. And this is costing approximately 900 billion um, annually. And as you can see here, um, Middle East of North Africa, as well as Southeast Asia are increasing the highest rate. In the United States, about 37 million are diagnosed with diabetes. So that's about one out of 10 Americans has diabetes and about one out of five don't even know that they have um, diabetes. Why is this even a big problem? Well, we're spending about 327 million billion a year and this is only increasing, but it, it's very important because it is the number one cause of blindness and heart stroke, at least for heart stroke, uh, heart disease, I should say, and stroke. So type two diabetes is multifactorial disease that has um, multiple risk factors um, that are listed here by the International Federation of Diabetes. So you can see family history of diabetes can make uh, an impact whether you will develop it, the, whether you are overweight, if you're living an unhealthy um, lifestyle or diet, and increasing with age also can be a factor. But two factors that has been added recently is the history of gestational diabetes. That is when you have diabetes during pregnancy and um, poor nutrition during pregnancy. And what this means is that the environment that you are exposed to when you are in utero when you are developing as a baby may have an additional effect on whether you're gonna develop type two diabetes later on in your life. So what goes wrong in type two diabetes? Type two diabetes is defined as uh, hyperglycemia. And in order for us to understand that, I wanted to tell you a little bit of physiology on the normal postprandial response to insulin. So glucose concentrations in the blood rise after a meal and as a result, the beta cell in the pancreas ascends that high glucose and it secretes hormone called insulin. And insulin does two things. It circulates in, in, the, circ in, in the bloodstream and reaches um, at the adipose tissue as well as the skeletal muscle, and it promotes glucose uptake. And in the liver, 
insulin acts to blunt glucose production. And the output of that is the reduction of, of blood glucose in the bloodstream. So what happened in um, type 2 diabetes? So when one ingests a meal, glucose still goes up. But the pancreas has impaired insulin secretion. And this is in part due to loss of beta cell mass or the total number of insulin producing cell. Because of the insulin resistance occurring in the peripheral tissue, this insulin level is not sufficient to lower glucose level or to increase glucose uptake. As a result, there is a reduction of glucose uptake. In the liver, insulin now cannot blunt glucose production. So as a result, there is now an increase in glucose and thus hyperglycemia in the bloodstream. So this is um, a cartoon of all the tissues that are involved, but the brain is not included here. Um, but you have the adipose tissue, you have the liver and the skeletal muscle. But what you can see here is the pancre pancreas working hard in balancing glucose homeostasis. And this is the focus tissue that we're working on in the lab. So we can view the evolution of beta cell um, adaptation to uh, type 2 diabetes in three different ways. So there is a susceptibility. So this is the genetic comp uh, component, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the fetal environment, as well as the postnatal environment. So these are the first 1,000 1, days uh, post birth. Then we have the adaptation period. And this adaptation period is what we call also as a compensatory period and failure. So I'm just going to walk you through here. As I mentioned earlier, uh, insulin resistance um, and obesity are associated with type 2 diabetes. So as depicted here, as an individual um, gain weight, insulin resistance is associated with that. And often what we see in the clinic is hyperinsulinemia. So you can see here in red, there is an increase in beta cell mass. And this is associated with their ability to expand their number, and therefore they are secreting more, and therefore you see hyperinsulinemia in patients. However, um, as the course progresses here, uh, eventually when obesity um, and insulin resistance is too high, this leads to the uh, glucolipotoxic conditions that causes a beta cell, the beta cells to undergo failure. And they go failure in multiple mechanisms, including oxidative stress, apoptosis, and more recently, a process called dedifferentiation. And basically, this dedifferentiation is a process that um, allows the beta cell to lose their identity as insulin producing beta cell and allowing them to acquire a new cell fate. Now, I haven't told you what are the other cells in the islets of Langerhams. Um, so another cells that's found there is alpha cells or cells that secretes glucagon. And glucagon um, is a hormone that is actually quite helpful during fasting states. So as opposed to insulin, when you are fasting, blood glucose needs to go up to maintain normal um, functioning in our body. And glucagon is that hormone that signals the liver to generate new glucose or uh, glucose production. So you can imagine that in situation where the beta cell lose their identi identity as insulin producing beta cell and be acquire a fate of alpha cell or glucagon producing cells, this can further exacerbate uh, hyperglycemia in the, in the bloodstream. So what are the long-term goals of potential solution for type 2 diabetes? Uh, when I started my lab about six years ago, I was very focused on identifying modifiable factors so that we can predict individual who may be at risk so that we can allow preventive intervention. As most of you know, most of the uh, uh, strategic uh, to cure diabetes right now is focused on giving drugs to individu individual who have type two diabetes. However, I do think in my group thinks that it's very important to prevent this disease, and therefore we need to find a markers or modify factors that we can manipulate so that we can prevent the onset of the disease. We're also quite interested in finding ways to grow new beta cell because 
in order in order for us to stop diabetes, we want to prevent it, but also find ways to help those who are already diagnosed with um, the disease. We also want to find ways how to keep existing beta cell healthy. And while we're putting them to work, we can protect them from those um, stress that I've mentioned earlier, such as ER stress, and of course, prevent them from de-differentiation uh, de and acquiring that cell fate such as alpha cell. This year, we've cel we celebrated the 100 years um, discovery of insulin, and it's amazing how far we've come uh, in terms of the technology and regulations of uh, glucose um, and with insulin pump. But as you can see here, about 50% of US adults diagnosed with type 2 diabetes still do not um, meet the, uh, the standard goal of acquiring a hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C less than 7%, suggesting that there's still a lot of work to be done. So standing at the shoulder of giants in the eyelid field, uh, I wanted to summarize uh, something very uh, unique to the, the beta cell, beta cell biology. So as you can see here on the y-axis is rates and level and time or age. As shown in red are an increasing rate of beta cell apoptosis, the uh, expression of cell inhibitors, as well as islet amylin deposition. On the green line, it is the beta cell proliferation rate. So this is the ability of the cells to self-duplicate. And a lot of proteins that are involved to modulate this process, um, such as cell cycle activators, pro-survival proteins. One of them is this O-gluconect transferase enzyme that I will share more uh, what it does in the beta cell later on. And transcription PDX1 all goes down with age, suggesting that the, um, if there's a window of opportunity for us to manipulate, it would be at this early time point um, uh, when the beta cells are being developed. So just to summarize, we, have, we now know that the formation of beta cell, both in rodents and in humans, um, that, the, uh, that it, this is set early in life. And once the beta cells are mature, they form from self-duplication, that proliferation that I was talking about. However, we now appreciate that this turnover is possible, but it's very, very slow. So uh, another uh, uh, vantage point view that we can uh, see from the shoulder of giants is that strong body of evidence suggests that maternal nutrition plays an important role in setting up the susceptibility of the offspring in developing um, non-communicable disease, um, including um, type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And again, this is just a summary here. I won't have time to, to tell you a little bit more about the history of the developmental origin of health disease. And what that means really is that the condition um, during pregnancy or mom's condition can have an impact on the developing fetus. And the developing fetus uh, uh, trajectory and uh, metabolic health trajectory can be altered depending on the uh, maternal condition. So as you can see here, suboptimal maternal environment can have an impact on the placenta, which then can have an impact whether it's through uh, nutrient flux of such as amino acids and glucose into the fetus. And we think that the beta cell is very sensitive to the nutrient levels during this time that can alter the total number of beta cell, again, the cells Hi. that makes that insulin. Hi. So what can we learn about um, preclinical studies? We now know that uh, clinical studies uh, are very, very hard, uh, difficult to do. Um, long, they are uh, longitudinal is what we need. We want to be able to follow baby X to adulthood. And this is something that we can do in animals. And so our, our lab and my previous uh, postdoctoral um, lab um, trainees have actually been um, involved in this subject matter. But I also wanted to uh, note really excellent labs such as Rebecca Simmons, Dr. Hill, Dr. Ozans, and Maureen Gannon, as well as Dr. Um, Limson, uh, has really contributed in this field. 
And so what we know is that nutrient depriva uh, deprivation, so this is low protein diet during pregnancy, reduce beta cell mass in the neonates. And this reduction of beta cell mass is associated with impaired glucose intolerance in adulthood. So this LP0.5 is the exposure of low protein diet throughout pregnancy. And this is very specific window of, um, of time. When you expose the dams with low protein diet, only the last week of pregnancy or the third trimester, we have a very different phenotype. The beta cell mass is formed during um, neonates. However, the, my, uh, the, the offspring are still glucose intolerant and we see defect in beta cell function in, in, with aging. Another model where we are manipulating the diet of the dam, instead we are reducing blood flow. And this is also a, a model of a hypertension during pregnancy or preeclampsia. What we show is that there is also a reduction of beta cell mass uh, starting at embryonic day 19.5, and this is sustained in adulthood. And this is also associated with um, glucose intolerant in the offspring. So I've, I've told you about uh, manipulations or malnutrition. What about if mom has overnutrition? So this is the case of obesity. We've also done this in mice where we expose the dam uh, with high fat diet throughout pregnancy. And what we found is that there is a reduction in the beta cell mass as well in the neonates. And when they grow into adulthood, they develop glucose intolerance. So it's really important to uh, recognize that this is a U shape. Malnutrition can have an impact on the developing fetus, but overnutrition such as obesity may also have the same effect. So why are the beta cell very sensitive to, to nutrients uh, in utero? So a beautiful study that was done by uh, Doug Milton's group um, uh, that was published in Nature in 2007, beautifully showed that the number and the proliferation rate of pancreatic progenitors represent the uh, critical and limiting determinant of beta cell mass. So what that means is an individual who may have more pancreatic progenitors may have more beta cell mass. And here are cell signaling pathways of how nutrients and hormones may, act, may function in the developing pancreas. So what I've depicted here is nutrients such as glucose and amino acid and growth factors such as insulin. And Downstream of the insulin receptor, for example, can activate pathways that are involved in mitogenic or as well as anabolic, depending if, it, if, if, if it's insulin. So what you can see here is that a kinase called mammalian target of rapamycin or mTOR is an integrator of both nutrients and growth factor. And what we have shown in my, in my postdoctoral lab uh, with Dr. Ernesto Bernasch's lab is that mTOR is so critical for pancreas um, development. Fact, when you delete mTOR in the pancreas of a mouse, they do not develop a pancreas. They have severe hypoplasia. And when you delete mTOR, or downstream targets of mTOR, such as Raptor in adulthood, those mice develop diabetes because they do not, they lose their beta cell. So the, re, so the beta cell is very sensitive to nutrients in utero because their pancreatic progenitors are uh, very sensitive to uh, the level of glucose as well as amino acid. So multiple groups, uh, including um, Dr. Raphael Scharfman um, and Alonso's group and my former PhD mentor has demonstrated that um, glucose and leucines regulates the, uh, the proliferation rate of, or how the uh, pancreatic endocrine cells uh, differentiate. And this hexosamine biosynthetic pathway is also an essential. And I will get back to you uh, about this later, because one of the enzymes that I will be talking, uh, OGT, or gluconac transferase, is actually uh, downstream of this uh, hexosamine biosynthetic pathway. 
So what's really important here to cue in is that uh, the effect of glucose and uh, of glucose is independent of the insulin receptor and that the effects of amino acids as well as glucose may, may be mediated by mTOR um, pathway. So now I wanna bridge a little bit, extend a little bit more about the fetal programming of beta cell. So one thing that I have, um, may have not uh, disclosed earlier is that there are multiple stressors of maternal malnutrition. So you can have calorie restriction, you can have a low protein diet, as I've mentioned, and depending on which uh, animal you're using, for example, you can do a reduction of placental uh, size or uh, change the, uh, the temperature and you can have a sheep undergo intrauterine growth restriction, the, the offspring. So what we know is that pregnancy complications such as prediabetes, gestational diabetes, obesity or multiparity all increases the risk of the mom developing type 2 diabetes later in life. But what about the, the offspring? So when it comes to gestational diabetes, uh, one of the pregnancy complications that we are aware of is macrosomia when the baby is bigger. And the hypothesis of why the baby is bigger is because mom, which has diabetes, has more glucose. Glucose can pass through the placenta go through the baby and the baby can stimulate its fetal insulin and insulin is a growth factor. Therefore, you have a bigger baby. And, but for a while, and this is something that I, something that my lab would like to shed light on is that there are patients who are, uh, have GDM, who have controlled glucose, yet they still have macrosomia baby. Not all of them, but some do and that they also have, the offspring have increased um, uh, adiposity, suggesting that there might be other mechanisms um, that could be uh, affecting uh, the fetal growth of the offspring. And the first thing that we worked on in the lab is also looking at the effect of maternal insulin. And you might be asking, well, why do you care about the uh, insulin? Insulin is actually increased uh, during the first and the second trimester pregnancy. And this insulin secretion is independent of insulin resistance. And, and this can be further exacerbated with um, pregnancy complications such as, just as I said, obesity and gestational diabetes. So as depicted here, insulin um, can bind to the insulin receptor or the insulin-like growth factor IGF-1 receptor. And downstream of the uh, uh, receptor, you can have the anabolic effect of insulin. And for a while, and this is a recent finding in the past few years, is that GLUT4, the glucose transporter that, ins that is insulin sensitive, is actually expressed in the placenta. And um, activation of mTOR can occur. So it is possible to hypothesize that even though insulin does not cross the placenta into the fetus to affect fetal growth, that insulin acting as a growth factor or as an anabolic hormone can impact the placenta and modulate nutrients to the fetus. So this is the first thing that we did in the lab. Um, in fact, it, it's still not published. Um, I, I exp I'm trying to tell you this story from top to the bottom, uh, but it, it's not necessarily the order of how it was done. So the first thing that we did is to show that insulin, maternal insulin um, can program or change the trajectory of the offspring. And I am going to tell you some of the data, two data that we have uncovered from two different models to mimic human pregnancies. So one model, is a hyperinsulinemia model that is associated with obesity. So this model is actually uh, first described by my, my mentor, Dr. Ernesto Bernal Mistraki, while he was a postdoc at WashU. And basically, Ernesto generated a mouse model where he overexpressed a protein called AKT, which is very important for beta cell growth and survival. So if you're overexpressing AKT, you have a mouse model that has a lot of beta cell. And so we thought, why can't we take this mom, take her into pregnancy and, and assess what happens to her offspring? So I will walk you through this one because it's, uh, I wanna make sure this is clear. 
So we have a wild type and a RIP AKT. So this is the, the dam that has hyperinsulinemia. So you can see she has a lot of beta cell mass. And uh, the, because of this increase in beta cell mass, she has lower glucose. And the level of insulin in her blood uh, is actually elevated. And so, and so when this mom gives birth, she can have two babies. One that is a negative for the AKT, so it's just a normal wild type mouse, or one that has the trench gene. So it has the capability of making that insulin, more insulin, just like mom. So when you look at the birth weight, if you take, compare the uh, birth weight of a, what we call hip hyperinsulinemia program, so these are the AKT negative, you can see that they have an increase in birth weight. However, if you have the, the, the RIP AKT, so this is a mouse that is capable of making its own AKT and was exposed with hyperinsulinemia through the mom, has a higher birth weight. So this tells us that insulin can regulate the fetal, gro fetal growth of the offspring. But really the questions that we wanted to know is that, okay, we can change the birth weight, but what is the health trajectory of the offspring? And I wanted to uh, define that one way for us of uh, um, uh, measuring what is altered program uh, metabolic health is glucose intolerance in the offspring. So now we're just only now focusing between the wild type and the, the hip, which is the uh, offspring that has no trench gene, but was only exposed to, hyper, uh, to hyperinsulinemia. At, at day P36, they have increased in body weight. And this increase in body weight was associated with um, impaired in glucose tolerance. So the y-axis here is the glucose, and this is time. And this is very similar to what we do in the clinic, where we fast the, the patients or the, the, the mice and then give them a bolus of glucose and measure how fast glucose get cleared. And what you can see here is that the control clear their glucose uh, level much faster versus the, the hip, suggesting that they have glucose intolerance. We have another model called um, the beta TSC2 knockout. So th this is again a hyperinsulinemia model where we deleted the negative regulator of mTOR, TSC2. So mTOR is a potent activator of beta cell mass. With more mTOR, you have more beta cell mass. But unlike the previous model, this is a model where the mom is lean, but it's hyperinsulinemia. And we ask the same questions, what happened to the offspring? So again, this is just a characterization of the mother. Uh, you can see here that she displays a higher level of insulin during pregnancy. What happened to the offspring? The offspring, just like the previous model that I showed you, developed glucose intolerance. Again, we are looking at the uh, area under the curve uh, and, uh, here where the control is shown in the open triangle and the hip, again, the negative, um, TSC2, but it's exposed to hyperinsulinemia, develop glucose intolerance. Again, suggesting to us that maternal hyperinsulinemia is sufficient to induce glucose intolerance in the offspring. And it doesn't matter if mom was hyperinsulinemic with obesity or without obesity. So we asked the next question. This is actually done as a thesis of a very talented student, Ms. Grace Chong, is she wanted to delete the insulin receptor in the placenta. And I wanted to uh, remind you that the insulin receptor can bind to the insulin receptor, a hybrid with the IG, uh, IGF-1 receptor or through the IGF-1. And both of these can have the mitogenic or growth effect as well as the metabolic effect, which we think could impact the metabolic programming of the offspring. So what happens when we knock out the insulin receptor in a normal pregnancy? This is work done by, uh, as I mentioned, Grace Chung and a postdoctoral fellow, uh, Dr. Roman, um, uh, Ram Kumar Mohan. And we deleted the insulin receptor in the placenta and we were very surprised to see that there was no change in placental uh, weight or fetal weight, as you can see here. And I was just showing you that unlike humans, uh, within the mouse, you can have multiple offspring and one of these could be a wild type of control and we will genotype them and basically follow them um, 
when they get older. And the reason why I also wanted to point this out is that I wanted to remind everyone what is fetal programming means. It means that we are manipulating during a very specific time. So during pregnancy, and then ask the questions, what happened later, many, many months later into that offspring. So there's no change in um, the uh, placental weight as well as in the fetal weight here, but we're showing that there is a reduction of the insulin um, receptor mRNA. What happens to the beta cell? The beta cell is actually quite normal. There was nothing that we can def uh, detect that is different, difference between the control or uh, another mouse that lacks the insulin receptor in the placenta, both in the male or in the female. And we followed this offspring in adulthood and asked the question, do they develop glucose intolerance or protective given the, uh, the, the, the uh, information that we got uh, when mom has a lot of insulin or hyperinsulinemia. What we found actually is that there was no phenotype that we can discern. And the only phenotype that we had or GRACE detected is that there is a protection uh, increase in insulin sensitivity only when mom has had a pregnancy greater than three. So this suggested to us that deletion of the insulin receptor has a beneficial effect if mom is experiencing um, some metabolic um, dysfunction that is associated with parity or having multiple pregnancies. There was no phenotype, as I told you, in normal chow diet. So we asked them, what happened if we challenge him and have high fat diet? And what you can see here in, in A is a glucose tolerance test again. But I want, again, I wanted to show you that this is the control in the, um, in the open triangle and in the filled triangle are offspring that lacks the insulin receptor. So what you can see here is that those offspring that experience deletion of the insulin receptor have improved glucose tolerance. Uh, and what's interesting is that we only saw this in the male and not in the female offspring. So another group has actually done this, and this is something that we're uh, trying to understand more, is that multiparity, which is very difficult to test in, in human, but we can do this in animals, so that we can actually ask the questions, what happened to the metabolic health of of the offspring when they are the first uh, litter or they are from the fourth pregnancy. So this is actually done by Dr. Wolitz's group. And what they show is that the offspring of dams that have been born from fourth pregnancy have glucose intolerance. And this is our GRACE data. And what we found is that if you're comparing the level of insulin between first and third pregnancy, it's actually elevated during third pregnancy. So we can only posit that in multiparous dam, they are experiencing hyperinsulinemia. And therefore, their offspring at the fourth pregnancy when insulin is level is high will display glucose intolerance, just like what I've shown you in the hyperinsulinemia model. So we wanted to do, uh, uh, to make sure that this is a, a parity. So Grace set up another cohort of mice and asked the question, is there a difference between an insulin receptor knockout offspring during first pregnancy versus third pregnancy? And this is what you're looking at in C. And what you can see here in C is that there is a reduction of, um, uh, of uh, percentage of blood glucose. This suggests that there is a uh, increase in insulin sensitivity. So let me just walk you through here. So just like the glucose tolerance where you fast the mice and uh, inject them with bolus of glucose, here you're injecting them with insulin and asking question of how fast their blood glucose drop. What you can see here is that those mice that are born from a third pregnancy, are re the clearance of their glucose is much faster, suggesting that they are more insulin sensitive. Downstream of the insulin receptor is the mTOR pathway. And we wanted to know if placental insulin mTOR uh, pathway is sufficient to really alter the metabolic health trajectory of the offspring. 
So we use the same model where we've, instead of knocking out the insulin receptor, we now knocked out mTOR, which was actually previously implicated in human studies to be a causative effect of fetal growth. There are beautiful work that has been done in humans where bigger babies have more mTOR signaling in the placenta and smaller babies have less mTOR signaling in the placenta, but all of these are associations. And we wanted to test this using genetic mouse model and we deleted mTOR in the placenta. This paper is now published. I am not showing this to you, uh, the data actually here, but we found that deletion of mTOR in the placenta reduced placental weight as well as the fetal uh, weight of the, the offspring. And uh, this is just, um, uh, again, the importance of that this is a placenta specific and we're just showing you data of a, a reporter showing that uh, the GFP is only expressed in the placenta. And as shown here, uh, I, placenta is smaller and the uh, architecture of the placenta may be altered, but this is something now that we are trying to understand in the lab. So what happened to the offspring? So adult female mTOR placenta deficient mice, they display exacerbated um, uh, phenotype under high fat diet challenge. So you can see here in A is the body weight. Um, so this is a time uh, how long they've been put in high fat diets and just body weight in the Y axis. And you can see here is that the open triangles is the control and mTOR knockout is the filled um, triangle. So when you put them in high-fat diet, one thing that you notice is that they are gaining more weight compared to the control. And the percent of uh, body fat is significantly increased. They are also displaying um, hyperglycemia throughout the course of high-fat diet. So this is a non-fasted glucose level. And we did the same experiment. We asked uh, what happened if you do the glucose tolerance test. And what you can see here, again, you know, we're, we're measuring how fast they clear their blood glucose level. And you can see here is that the control uh, clears their blood glucose level much faster compared to the knockout. And what's more interesting is when we do the insulin sensitivity test, again, injecting them with insulin and measuring how fast glucose goes down, you can see that they are taking a lot longer to lower their, their glucose level, suggesting that they are insulin resistant. And if you remember what I uh, ex said, said earlier, obesity and insulin resistance is associated with hyperinsulinemia. And indeed, we see a hyperinsul a hyperinsulinemia here. It's near significance. Uh, however, the level of insulin resistance, uh, we should have expected more insulin suggesting that there might be a defect in the pancreas. So you can see here, um, we actually measured this, the amount of glucose, uh, uh, treat them with glucose and measure the amount of insulin that they're secreting. Um, and because they've been in high fat diet for such a long time, we can't really tell a difference uh, between the control and the neck out. But what's so evident to us is that the number or the uh, beta cell mass between the control and the knockout is not changed, suggesting that there might be a defect in the ability of the beta cell to compensate for this insulin resistance. We, because we're trying to show causality here, we did the opposite, where we now deleted a negative regulator of mTOR called TSC2. So the effect of this is to increase placental mTOR. And we asked the question, what happens when we put them in high fat diet? So you can see here, again, the control uh, in the open diamond versus knockout uh, filled diamond. So the filled diamond, those are the mice that have increased mTOR C1. And what you can appreciate here is that throughout the course of high fat diet, that they are resistant in, in, in gaining weight. And when we did the glucose tolerance test again, unlike the mTOR knockout, these um, mice that have increased mTOR signaling actually have a lower area under the curve in their IPGTT, suggesting that they are more uh, glucose tolerant. When we test insulin sensitivity, we can actually discern between the control and the knockout. But what's clear to us is that they are, um, have lower level of insulin uh, in the circulation, suggesting that they may have a improved insulin sensitivity. 
and throughout the course of high fat diet. And you can see here, random versus fasting, the mTOR um, or the TSC2 are not increasing their insulin at even at 12 weeks uh, of high fat diet, both in, in the male and in the female. So to summarize, I wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, I've shown you that maternal hyperinsulinemia during pregnancy is sufficient to program glucose intolerance only in the adult male offspring, and that the placental insulin receptor ablation improves glucose tolerance only in multiparisneum, and that deletion of mTOR causes, increases the susceptibility of the female in developing obesity and insulin resistance, and vice versa, if we increase placental mTOR uh, in the placenta and the offspring now have improved insulin sensitivity and in part because they are not gaining weight and we don't know the mechanisms of how that occur, but we are testing the possibility that they're, because they are not making insulin during uh, the course of obesity, this is helping them in staying um, uh, insulin sensitive. So I want to circle back uh, in the very beginning where I've said why the beta cells are very sensitive to nutrients. And we, when we did actually the low protein diet during pregnancy, uh, we found that the reduction of beta cell mass and insulin secretion was associated with very specific sets of proteins that are critical for beta cell health. And one of them is the PDX1, a transcription factor that it's dubbed as the master regulator of the pancreas. Deletion of this transcription factor, PDX1, causes pancreas hypoplasia. mTOR, again, the mammalian target of rapamycin, also causes hypoplasia. And now I want to talk to you about a protein called O-gluconate transferase, which is also a nutrient sensor protein. So in the low protein diet that I mentioned, uh, we knew that overexpression of mTOR C1 during pregnancy was able to reverse the phenotype that we saw, the reduction in the beta cell mass and the development of glucose intolerance. We also knew that the ink that uh, blocking microRNAs that was very spe that was in specifically increased in the islets, and there's only very few microRNAs, and they are microRNA 199 and 7, that if you block these microRNAs, they too prevent the degradation of mTOR and OGT and improve insulin secretion. So when I started my lab, I also became very interested in this other nutrient sensor protein called OGT and what is it doing in beta cell development and function. So I wanna pause here and kind of give you an introduction what OGT is. And OGT is an enzyme that is involved in uh, post-translational protein modification called gluconacylation. And why it is called as a nutrient sensor, it's because it takes nutrients through the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway to form uh, UDP gluconac, which is a molecule that it uses to add onto protein. And this is a form of modification that is important for the activity, localization, or stability of that protein essentially of how it is regulated. So it's very dynamic process, uh, just like phosphorylation where it can come on and off. So there are two enzymes uh, modulating these uh, processes, the OGT, which we dub as the writer, the one that adds the ogluconacylation, and OGA, the eraser that removes the ogluconac modification. So OGT is actually highly expressed uh, in ubiquitously across all tissues, but it's highly expressed in the pancreas as well as in the placenta. Within the pancreas, uh, I, OGT is highly expressed in the islet and not in the acinar tissue. We also uncovered uh, that in humans, islets that are obese, uh, RL2, the, uh, the antibody that detects the ogluconacylation, so this is a global ogluconacylation, that this is increased in obese individual. And the level of OGT is reduced uh, in obese islets, suggesting to us that OGT could be playing a role in that compensatory or the adaptation in high-fat diet or obesity. 
So one of the first questions we ask is, is OGT important in pancreas development? And the way we did this is we, again, use our genetic mouse model to delete OGT specifically in pancreatic progenitors. And first thing that we showed here, I think, which is important, is that uh, the RL2 level across embryonic uh, pancreas, suggesting that there's a lot of gluconephalation or modification occurring. We don't know which proteins they are being uh, modified, but we know that it is happening. And deletion of OGT in pancreatic progenitors leads to hypoplasia. Here's a normal pancreas where you see this white tissue that is the, the pancreas, where that in the OGT knockout, that is completely uh, lost. And these are just the images of uh, pancreatic beta cells, the developing pancreatic beta cells. And what I hope you can appreciate here is that between the control and the knockout, you don't see the formation of insulin producing beta cells shown in red and PDX1 uh, in green, which is a marker for mature beta cell. So what you can see in the OGT knockout is that there's a significant loss of beta cell, not only beta cell, but also glucagon. We deleted OGT at a later time point. So instead of embryonic day nine, where the pancreatic progenitors are PDX1 is being expressed, we deleted it at a later time point. And what we found is that they are still there. So OGT deletion in the islets or the endocrine progenitors does not impair pancreas development, suggesting to us that the OGT is much uh, playing an important role in an earlier time point. But I have wanted to say that even though the beta cells are there, uh, when these mice, uh, I will not show you the data, but when they get to day 30 to 60, they develop severe diabetes because OGT becomes very important in the function of the beta cell. We also deleted OGT directly in insulin producing beta cell. And what we found is that OGT developed diabetes, uh, OGT knockout developed diabetes. So you can see here the control, this is glucose across time. And you can see that the OGT knockout developed severe hyperglycemia. This severe hyperglycemia was associated with beta cell death. And prior to the onset of hyperglycemia, we see an increase in ER stress. And you can see here in the electron microscopy uh, um, images, uh, you can see uh, a control versus an OGT knockout. And first thing you see is that there's not a lot of insulin granules. And uh, here's an example of a distended uh, ER, suggesting that these mice are uh, uh, experiencing ER stress prior to the hyperglycemia that then lead them to develop diabetes. In addition to uh, loss of insulin content, uh, we also identified that uh, OGT is playing an important role in the processing of insulin. So insulin is processed from pro-insulin to insulin, and a protein that's involved in this process is called carboxypeptidase E. And carboxypeptidase E is reducing the OGT knockout. Uh, you can see here, uh, first of all, in A, there's a reduction of insulin content. There's an increase in pro-insulin. So that suggested to us that there is a processing um, uh, problem. And one of the proteins that's playing an important role is this protein called CPE and it's reduced. And you can see here that this is about 50% reduction. But I wanted you to appreciate this reduction because even though it's 50%, these are mixtures of cells. Remember in the islets of Langerhams, about only 80% of the cells are beta cells and you have the alpha cells and delta cells and other cells. But if you do immunostaining, what you can see here is that in the control in the top, and OGT knockout at the bottom, and you can see insulin, you CPE, which is both expressed in the beta cell and as well in the alpha cell, but you can see that it's specifically lost or reduced in the beta cells of the OGT knockout. And the other thing that we did, uh, a very talented student, uh, um, Sequin Joe, he actually overexpressed uh, CPE uh, in the uh, OGT knockout, and we can rescue the phenotype of pro-insulin. You can see a significant reduction between the OGT knockout versus the OGT knockout with CPE. So putting back CPE, we were able to reduce uh, pro-insulin level. So it's being processed properly as is insulin. 
we also identified the mechanisms of how this occurred. Uh, uh, OGT, uh, there was a, the reason why in the OGT knockout, CPE was uh, reduced in part because of an indirect way which OGT actually ogluconaculates a protein called EIF4G1 that's involved in specific translation of CPE. And what we found is that if you, uh, that like CPE, EIF4G1 too is reduced in the OGT knockout. Uh, but if you put back uh, EIF4G1, you can actually rescue uh, the phenotype. So, this has been published, but I wanted to just share with you that the importance of the, because we tried to find what is the importance of the gluconaculation on this protein. So we actually have a control wild type and mutation uh, from a serine to alanine where the gluconaculation can take place. What we found actually is that in terms of the CPE protein level, gluconaculation is not important. It's because both the wild type or the mutant can increase CPE level. And as shown here, uh, again, you have the OGT knockout. And if you give them uh, EI4G1, we can bring up CPE. But this has nothing to do with the, the, the ogluconaculation of this um, uh, of EI4G1. The ogluconaculation of EI4G1 by OGT is uh, affecting its stability, but not its ability to affect the translation of CPE. So another student in my lab, uh, Dr. Amber Lecter, who is now a postdoctoral fellow at the NIH, was very interested in the role of OGT in that beta cell adaptation phase or compensatory phase uh, during obesity. And normally during obesity, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is an increase in insulin secretion to compensate for that insulin resistance. And we, Ember wanted to know what could be the uh, mechanisms of why that is. So you can imagine that OGT is an enzyme that can regulate multiple proteins. So we thought it's very likely that OGT could play a role in this process because we saw OGT not only as a nutrient sensor protein, but it also has the capability of integrating a signaling network. So Amber uh, did an experiment where she put mice in high fat diet throughout uh, six weeks, 12 weeks to 18 weeks. And she measured again um, RL2, which is the global detect antibody that can detect uh, ogluconaculation. So what you can see here in the control, uh, uh, control versus high fat diet is that there's an increase in ogluconaculation, and these are done in the females. Uh, and we probe for OGT and OGA as well. But what you can see here is that there's specific elevation or increase in 50 to 60 kilodalton protein. And in fact, this is actually uh, not seen in the different uh, uh, higher levels or higher uh, size of protein. The level of OGT or OGA itself wasn't altered. We did, she did the same experiment in the, fem, in, in the male islets. Again, we, she saw an increase in ogluconaculation in high fat diet, but unlike the female, she observed increase in different sizes of proteins from the 50 to 60 kilodalton all the way to a bigger size of protein. And this increase in ogluconaculation was associated with increased level of OGT as well as OGA. And she also found that in a prolonged state of obesity, such as 18 weeks of high fat diet, the reverse happened. OGT or ogluconaculation is reduced in high fat diet. And again, in the female, we see this in the specific range of 50 to 60 uh, kilodalton. And this is associated in a phase where there is now a reduction in um, insulin secretion. So it could be past that compensatory uh, state. Another model uh, that Ember used to show causality is she was able to use a inducible mouse model of OGT, where unlike the OGT that I mentioned to you before, where you delete it very early in life, they develop diabetes. However, a inducible model of OGT, they don't develop uh, diabetes. 
what what Ember took these mice and basically again put them in high fat diet. And what you can notice here is that throughout the course of high fat diet, uh, nine weeks of high fat diet, they don't gain weight. And this uh, how compared to the control, the uh, level of insulin is also reduced uh, both in the fasting and in the glu uh, on glucose state. Um, so. Ember's project or thesis have demonstrated to us that uh, in the course of obesity, uh, OGT is playing an important role in the hyperinsulinemia that we see. One of the phenotypes that uh, we noticed before the onset of ER stress or diabetes in the OGT knockout was the abnormality of the mitochondria. And a postdoctoral fellow and um, a Sequin Joe, grad student in the lab, have worked on this and basically demonstrated that in the OGT knockout, the mitochondria are a structure were perturbed. We see mitochondria that's round versus this tubular or sausage shaped like mitochondria that you see here in the control. And we identified a protein called PDX1, which is a protein that is ogluconac modified and the protein level of PDX1 is reduced in the OGT knockout. And Ram thought, while well, we put back PDX1, can we rescue the phenotype? So the data in terms of the structure, uh, you can see it here, that the, the tubular, um, so let me just walk you through here. So the open circles, the control, the field is the neck out, and the uh, triangle is, um, is the transgenic, the OGT neck out with PDX1 overexpressor. So what you can see here is that there is a increase in the number of the tubular with PDX1 put back in there. The swollen shape mitochondria is also significantly reduced. And the total number of mitochondria is increased with PDX1. More importantly, when we perform mitochondrial function using the seahorse where we can measure the oxygen consumption rate, you can see here that the, the compare, comparing the knock out, uh, the control in the knock out, the PDX1 transgenic is able to rescue the phenotype of the knock out, suggesting that overexpression of PDX1 is able to rescue the mitochondrial uh, dysfunction that we are seeing in the OGT knock out. So to summarize uh, what I've shown you about OGT, OGT deletion in pancreatic progenitors led to hypoplasia in, uh, in neonatal uh, pancreas. And I didn't show you how this occurred, but it's through apoptosis. Uh, deletion of OGT in mature beta cells uh, causes uh, ER stress, mitochondrial dysfunction. And we are able to reverse the phenotype by overexpressing PDX1. Carbo carboxypeptidase E is dysregulated in the OGT knockout. Uh, which contributes to uh, hyperproinsulinemia. And we have identified that EIF4G1 is the mechanisms of how that occurs. Uh, Ember have shown that the uh, increase in ogluconaculation uh, during early obesity is important for that onset for hyperinsulinemia. Uh, it's really important for the lipid potentiation of insulin um, secretion. And I didn't show this, but we identified that this is going through a protein called Circa that's involved in calcium uh, handling. And finally, I showed you that uh, OGT regulates mitochondrial function and, and in part through PDX1. And like mTOR, which is seen as a nutrient sensor protein in the beta cell, OGT is also quite important as a nutrient sensor. Uh, we are now studying, um, uh, we now have, I should say, studies ongoing that's looking at how potentially OGT could regulate uh, or crosstalk with mTOR. So with that, I want to end my, my lecture by thanking members of my lab. Uh, we started in 2015, and what you're seeing here in the screen are the trainees that I, I've had the privilege of working with. I have a senior scientist, Dr. Eric Gustafson, who is a phenomenal electrophysiologist, postdoctoral fellows uh, who have trained and who are now, some of them are doing their own uh, independent work now or are still continuing um, their training because they are clinical fellows. 
And uh, Dr. Megan Beach, who is in the lab, who is now studying what's the role of the IGF-1 receptor in the placenta. And we have graduate students, uh, Dr. Amber Lockridge, who is now a postdoctoral fellow at the NIH, and Sequin Joe and Alicia are still in the lab working on the role of uh, autophagy in, uh, in, in the islet. And Alicia is trying to understand the role of OGT in uh, beta cell identity. We've had a very uh, talented post-baccalaureate who are on their way to graduate school, uh, uh, Mr. Daniel Baman, who is now a fourth year a PhD grad student here in our department, and Brian Akapong, who is excited to uh, start graduate school um, in the fall. And I would like to thank our collaborators. I, I work very closely with Dr. Jean Briegel and Dr. Ron Briegel, who is a biostatistician bi at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. I have I received good mentoring, and I really enjoy uh, speaking with Dr. Uh, Bob Sorensen, who is well known for his work in islet biology or islet uh, in pregnancy. And I'm very fortunate to have collaborators uh, uh, from the Philippines, uh, Dr. Maria uh, Pineda Portel, who has introduced me to uh, placental um, samples there in the Philippines, my home country, and Dr. Sarah Rodimont, who is here at the University of Minnesota, because we're also establishing a cohort of patients here uh, in Minnesota as well. Uh, we collaborate with Dr. Christina Wu and other Ognukunak folks, uh, that's Dr. Uh, Jan Hanover, who have given us the OGA mice and we're, we're still phenotyping them out. I still collaborate with my mentor and uh, colleagues from Michigan, uh, Bridget Gregg and uh, Dr. Singer. And I also wanted to thank our core, Dr. Alexandra Bartolomucci and Dr. Pilar Guzman, who does a lot of our, our animal work um, in terms of um, surgery. So thank you. And Again, I, a lot of the work that I presented to you would have not been possible without the dedication of, of, of my team. And I thank them for their dedication to science and their commitment to doing good work and really doing uh, good science. And with that, I wanna thank my uh, funding that has supported our lab through the NIDDK as well as the NICHD, the Regenerative Medicine Minnesota, as well as the McKnight Foundation here and my trainees are funded through T32s or F31 through the NIH. And I also just want to give thanks to my mentors who have given me um, the path to a science. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Oka Lenmark who gave me uh, the opportunity to enjoy science. He actually sent me to Sardinia, Italy, and that was it. I just fell in love with science and I said I can travel. And of course, that was uh, solidified when I worked at the NIH with Dr. Elise Cohn. And I want to give a special thank to uh, Jim Johnson, who, who took me uh, under his wing and um, basically trained me. Um, and I'm still working on insulin, Jim. And of course, uh, Ernesto Bernal Mishraki, um, he has been an excellent mentor and I wouldn't be here without him. And I've had so many mentors. When I came to the University of Minnesota, I was very fortunate to have individuals who didn't know me before and they were ready to mentor me on the go. And I wanna thank Dr. David ben -Lorf. He was my KO1 mentor and my chair department, Dr. Um, Joseph Metzner, and of course, Dr. Jean Riegel for their support. I also want to thank my big family, my mom and dad. Um, this was taken a few years ago when we have our big anniversary, family anniversary. I just want to thank them for their love and support. And finally, I want to thank the loves of my life, uh, my husband, um, Mark Igonia, for being the best husband and dad, very supportive. Uh, I just love him so much. And my two girls, Mira and Kaya, for my source of inspiration and joy and for keeping us uh, on our toes. Uh, we love living here in the state of hockey. And so both of my girls uh, play hockey. And with that, I wanna thank you all for uh, this opportunity. Again, uh, what an amazing experience for me to be giving this college lectureship and now Thank you, and I'll take any questions that you may have. 
Thank you so much, Emmeline. And we would like to present you on behalf of the APS with this memento. Um, and it was a fascinating story of how important clinical research, uh, basic research is to clinical medicine. Uh, so we are over time, but we are going to go ahead and let you answer some questions for those who can hang on and, and listen. And Linda will take over the questions. So one of the questions um, is something that you touched on just at the end. And I don't know if you have any insights into how OGT and mTOR may interact with each other. Um, do you, th you know, obviously you said you're starting to work on that. So you must have some thoughts about um, uh, how they interact to regulate beta cells. Very good questions. I, I will. I just didn't have time to put the data today. Uh, the thesis of Sequan Jo is looking at specifically how, well, one of the phenotypes that we saw in the OGT Naka was increase in autophagy. And this increase in autophagy was associated with reduction of downstream targets of mTOR. So we started asking the question, can we rescue the, o the phenotype of the OGT by just putting back M4. And what we found is that we can't. To some degree, we can, but we can't. So this tells us that uh, potentially OGT is working upstream of mTOR or that OGT uh, regulates multiple arms of the mTOR signaling pathway. We do know that TSC2 is not obliquinac modified. We just actually got the RNA-seq uh, as well as the uh, proteomics of numbers of beta cells that are oblipunac modified, then our goal is to figure out if any of those arms are uh, mTOR pathways are oblipunac modified. But we do have data to suggest that in any model that we looked at, M OGT is high, mTOR is high, OGT is low, uh, mTOR is low. So it might be suggesting that uh, OGT cross stops regulates uh, mTOR. We're trying to still piece out who's on top um, or whether they are in parallel but having a, a communication via crosstalk. Great, great, thanks. Um, a couple questions um, that are related, one from Michelle Bach and the other from Alicia Wong. Um, first, is your hip offspring heterozygous for the transgene? So for clarification, the, the hip are not it, they are negative, so they don't have the transgene at all. Okay. So, so we were just using the the uh, the transgene so that mommy during pregnancy can have hyperinsulinemia. However, mom will have two offspring, at least two possible offspring types, I should say, a control versus a positive for the transgene. So we have another dam, another mom where we are comparing uh, the effect of that that is non-hyperinsulinemia. I hope that makes sense. Basically, the hip is a non-transgenic animal. Right. And then uh, a related question, do these hip mice have sustained increased body weight after postnatal 36, day 36? Another excellent question. We have not uh, looked up beyond uh, day 36. Uh, some, so the way we've done those, those data that I showed you with the, the rip three were partly done in Michigan. And so we were able to recapitulate that in Minnesota, uh, the TSC2, and we were able to see that it was sufficient. And we were just ready to knock out the insulin receptor. And uh, we were, so, we haven't, but we should look into that to see if it's sustained uh, across uh, lifespan. Great. Then um, a, another couple of related questions, one from Anna Hanapalam and the other from Leping Feng. Um, Leping um, compliments you saying wonderful work and yeah. is the placental knockout specific to the placenta? Very good question. Um, so we're using the CYP CRE from Gustavo de Leon. And by the time I started my lab, I can tell you a lot of people have used it. And I wanted to make sure that we are on the set on the good footing. And we actually did various validation. 
So Gustavo de Leon had created different founders. And of course, he told us we got the 5912 and one, we wanted to make sure that it was placenta specific. So when we bred our mice with a, a transgenic uh, reporter, we can only see it in the placenta where we would expect it to be. Another group from the UK was able to confirm that it's also in the placenta. So uh, farther that we did is we were able to look at uh, the offspring and ask the question, is the reporter at all in the offspring? We looked at uh, the islet, the liver, and adipose tissue. mTOR was not altered in any of those tissue. But also when we did a whole fetal imaging with GFP, uh, we saw a little bit of GFP kind of in the skin, but not in the metabolic tissue. So it was also reported in the original paper that about 4% uh, of the fetus would have some expression in the skin. And so, uh, so it's not 100% uh, placenta, so to speak, but we verified it's not altered in metabolic tissues, such as in the in the base, in the islets, I should say, the, the liver and in adipose tissue. And and then a kind of a technical question: in the insulin receptor deleted pa uh, placenta, the mRNA was decreased, but um, only marginally. And um, they're asking, did you also measure protein? Excellent question. Um, we did not measure the protein itself, but uh, Tracy Bell, who has looked at the insulin receptor in terms of the brain, she did. She looked at the protein and she showed that it was reduced. So most, so most of these transgene, uh, the Cree, uh, how it works is that you're not really deleting the mRNA, but you see reduction, it's because you are basically, uh, you are technically just mutating parts of that gene. And then they are, that it's so essential for the translation of that protein. But so when you're measuring for the, pro, for the mRNA, what you're seeing is expected it's about 50% reduction. So what we saw, um, an increase in mRNA actually is the IGF-1 receptor. Uh, that was increased. And so uh, we're at the, the interpretation of the data that the normal effect of deletion of insulin receptor during pregnancy one, it's because is it insulin going through the IGF-1 receptor when you knocked it out? So, or perhaps you can think, and we know that uh, insulin receptor and IGF-1, those are additives effect but perhaps only in metabolic uh, dysfunctions such as, such as hyperinsulinemia, that you see a beneficial effect of removing or blunting insulin signaling in the placenta. Great, thanks. And then uh, one other question that's maybe a little bit more of a, a broader question for you to comment on. Um, how can we take species differences into consideration in pancreatic studies using mouse models to address human diabetes? Very good questions. There are different um, difference. I mean, there are difference in terms of the biology, we think, in terms of human uh, beta cell versus mouse beta cell. So the, for example, uh, like placental lactogen, for example, during pregnancy has been shown to Pro, to promote beta cell proliferation in a rodent, but that may not be the case in, in, in human. Uh, so most of the things that we do in the lab and typically most labs do is that when you find something so critical or it's occurring in a mouse model, the idea is to repeat that in a human um, beta cell to see if that is consistent. Now, if you're asking within the, you know, uh, so, so that's kind of my answer to that. Uh, I do think that we still need animals or rodents to be able to um, study because one of the things that, especially in fetal programming, because our goal is to be able to follow the offspring post manipulation, because I think that this is so important in terms of the long-term big picture of uh, finding the mechanism so that we can potentially prevent the onset of diabetes in the future. Great, great, yeah. Uh, and that's the end of the Q&A questions, but I, I have a question about your placental 
mTOR models. And maybe you showed this and I missed it, but do you see um, differences in beta cell mass in the um, when mTOR is manipulated in the placenta? So in the GCI Insight paper, we reported that in newborn, uh, they do not have an alteration in the beta cell mass. What we are finding now uh, is uh, it's unpublished data, but we do think that during embryonic stages, there is actually uh, an increase in beta cell mass, which is the opposite of what <laughs> I would have expected. Right. Because in human, data suggests that smaller baby, smaller, lower mTOR signaling, bigger baby, more placental mTOR signaling. And mTOR is thought to believe to promote nutrient flux specifically for amino acid. So the idea, if you knock out mTOR, we think that it would be lower amino acid, therefore lower amino acid going into the, the pancreas of the baby, lower beta cell mass. But where we're finding actually is that there could be a compensation happening, that the, the transporters are uh, like GLUT1, for example, is increased in the placenta of the mTOR knockout. So that could potentially be affecting, but, but at newborn, there's no difference. But what we are, I think what we are affecting is how the beta cell are sensing nutrients. It's not, so let me rephrase. The manipulation of placental mTOR, at least from the newborn, we don't think it's affecting their total number. What we think is happening is how they are functioning, how they are sensing nutrients. And that's something that uh, we are focusing on um, right now. Uh, we do think that that's where the effect of the placental mTOR is in the beta cell. Great. So um, I'm going to turn turn the mic over to Dee, who can ask whatever questions she has and close us out. I Mine is going all the way back to your beginning uh, slides about diabetes and obesity in humans, but we have so many young women that are concerned with uh, managing their weight during pregnancy because of the body consciousness. They don't want to get fat. Are there any observational studies about later development of type two diabetes in the offspring of uh, young women that are well nourished, but choosing not to gain weight during pregnancy? Oh, that is an excellent question, Dee. I, you know, I, I, I am not aware of it. Um, I was just gonna double down that, you know, uh, women who are obese during pregnancy, uh, we're learning new knowledge that exercising during pregnancy uh, is sufficient to negate some of this effect. And that's why mm -hmm. I think it's so important to understand the mechanisms because we are learning more that it's not all about mom. Mom nutrition is important. Uh, dad's health is also important. And I think there's nothing more important uh, for us, even just for messaging, you know, like how what happens during this special time of development could actually change the trajectory of your offspring. And I think that that is one way we can uh, at least reduce the prevalence of type 2 diabetes once we start uh, thinking that way um, for the generations uh, to come. Excellent. And I think with that, we've run a little bit over time, but I thank everyone for attending and I hope you'll come back to some of our APS webinars and I think we'll say good day. Thank you.